And I, in this talk, I'll try to offer some vision for the future. But in preparing this talk, I felt, felt like I have an enormous challenge, uh, given the audience. On one hand, this is some of the most brilliant people in the world. And on the other hand, we have a very broad spectrum of background here. People from different branches of science, mathematics, and so forth. So what I th thought I should do is give kind of a bird-eye view of physics, and specifically quantum field theory. And in order to do that, I should really start with some historical context. And for historical context, no better place to start is classical physics. And part one in classical physics is classical mechanics. Describes the time evolution of a finite number of particles. And two names that I put here are Newton and Lagrange, because as the mathematics of this evolved, Lagrange played a crucial role in his Lagrangian mechanics and the role of Lagrangians. And the language this is being used here is the language of ordinary differential equations. In fact, calculus was invented primarily for this purpose. This is why calculus was invented by Newton and others, and developed further by various French mathematicians and others. And this is a more or less done deal. We fully understand that, and everybody is happy. The first generalization of that came about a century or two later, when instead of classical mechanics, we have classical field theory. And the difference between the left side and the right side is that we still have time evolution, but here we have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Not just one degree of freedom, but the whole continuum of degrees of freedom. For example, the electromagnetic field, or the velocity field of a fluid, or a metric, and I put Maxwell and Einstein here, I could have put Navier and Stokes, and there are other people who contributed uh, to it. Now, both of these, and here the mat natural mathematical language, instead of ODE, we have PDEs, partial differential equations, and the common thing for all of these is calculus. So we can say that calculus is the language of classical physics. We discuss classical physics in terms of calculus. This is the language we use. Calculus is very important. It's very deep. And I thought it, it's appropriate to have one slide to tell you my view of calculus, because we'll contrast that later with things that I will say about more modern developments. So first of all, at the time, this was new mathematics. So the time of Newton, this is Newton. This was new mathematics that had to be invented in order to describe the physical phenomena. And it was usually motivated, was motivated by physics. This was one of the main motivations that Newton had to invent calculus. So these are two elements, new mathematics motivated by physics. Then it had many applications in mathematics, in physics, other branches of science, even in the social science, they use calculus these days. And of course, engineering. This is the hallmark of a deep idea. A deep idea is something that appears to solve one problem, but turns out to solve many other problems it was not intended to solve. So the criterion for a deep idea, it does better than it was supposed to do. It was designed to do one thing and does many other things. I would also say that calculus is a mature field. So let me present a test of maturity. How do we know whether a field is mature or not? So my test is the following. If most books and most courses are more or less the same, so if you go and take a calculus course here in Bangalore or at Harvard or at Santa Barbara or wherever, it, the course will be more or less the same. First, they will teach you how to differentiate, then they will teach you how to integrate, then there will be some differential equations. It's more or less the same logical order. That's a sign that it has been stabilized, the presentation has been stabilized and streamlined. So, so much for classical physics, let me move to quantum physics. And just as in classical mechanics, we had classical mechanics and then classical field theory, here we start with quantum mechanics. And very much like in classical mechanics, we have a finite number of degrees of freedom, except that here these are quantum particles. Many more people contributed to it. I'm not going through the list of people. And the natural mathematical setup is operators acting in a Hilbert space, or we can describe it using functional integral. There are various other ways of describing it. And now we need to put something in the right column, which would be the parallel of what we had before in classical mechanics versus classical field theory. So here we should put quantum field theory, and it's very much kind of completing the square 
we have time evolution of an infinite number of quantum degrees of freedom. Before we had classical, now we have quantum degrees of freedom. For example, the electromagnetic field. So unlike the other three parts of these boxes, classical mechanics, uh, classical field theory, and quantum mechanics, this is still an intense field of study. A lot is known, but there's still exciting progress. We've heard some exciting progress this morning. And my personal view is that, it, that a new intellectual structure is needed. And if before we had calculus for both, uh, for both columns, and this was ODEs and PDEs, and now we have operators in a Hilbert space and functional integral, here I feel that a lot more is needed, and I'll say more about that later. And for lack of a better name, I would just call that quantum field theory. This intellectual structure, which is still missing, we just give it the only name we have. I'd like to emphasize that quantum field theory appears everywhere. So let's go through some of the applications. First, in particle physics, this is the language used to describe the standard model. So the standard model of particle physics is enormously successful. Fantastic agreement between theory and experiment. And this is one example. It's not a typical one, but it's a good one. It's the electromagnetic dipole moment. It's known theoretically to enormous accuracy. It's known experimentally also to enormous accuracy. No other branch of science has such spectacular agreement between theory and experiment. So many significant digits. There's nothing in theory, nothing in any science, biology, chemistry, geophysics, even in most of physics, there's nothing that reaches that level of accuracy. And there are two lessons to draw from that. First of all, it really means that we know what we are doing. We really know what we are doing because every digit here probes some other aspects of our understanding. Quantum mechanics, special relativity, the weak force, the strong force, and so forth. The second lesson from here, which agrees with David's talk this morning, is that the experimentalists are better than the theorists. They have one more significant digit that we have, and there's still a long way to go. The second application is in condensed matter physics, and we've heard about it from the three beautiful talks this morning. This gives us, quantum field theory gives us a description of the long distance properties of materials. What kind of phases can there be? What kind of phase transitions can there be between different phases of matter? And it also appears in cosmology. This is where we have a description of the early universe, inflations, fluctuations in the microwave background radiation. That all comes from quantum field theory. Quantum field theory also appears in the study of quantum gravity and string theory. And over the years, it has appeared in three different places there. First, it appeared in, on the wall sheet of the string. The wall sheet of the string sweeps, the, the string evolves a two-dimensional surface. And there is a quantum field theory on that surface, which is essential in describing string theory. The second application is in the low energy approximation, where we have ordinary particles, ordinary fields, where the string is approximated by a point, and that's another place quantum field theory appears. And in, over the last 20 years, it became clear that the whole theory could be just a quantum field theory in disguise. And that came from gauge gravity duality, or ADS-CFT. I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. So that was another application. And finally, there's the application in mathematics, especially in the fields of geometry and topology, where results from quantum field theory completely changed some fields in mathematics. In fact, this week there was a school here about gromov witten invariants, which were really motivated by physics, by the study of Calabi-Yau manifolds. That's why the mathematicians were interested in it. And in physics, it came from this application of field theory, of the wall sheet of the string uh, propagating in some Calabi-Yau background. So continuing with quantum field theories everywhere, it really reminiscent of the story of calculus. We have some intellectual structure, which was invented for one purpose, describing a system with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, or a system which is both relativistic and quantum mechanical, and it has these applications everywhere. So it's the natural language to describe diverse phenomena. And even though we have seen a lot of progress over the last decades, uh, progress is still continuing. And there, is a lot of, there are many indications that our understanding is incomplete. And since I've been saying that before and I was criticized, I would like to make it absolutely clear. It's not that our understanding is wrong. I think that big pieces are still missing. And perhaps 
the theory should be reformulated. So I'd like to go back to the analogy with calculus and make this analogy more complete and see how, as a scorecard, how quantum field theory uh, does relative to calculus. So I just copied the slide before about calculus. Calculus was a new mathematics at the time. Well, it's clearly new here because to the extent that we know it, we think it's not only is it new, it's not yet even rigorous. So that's even something for the future to make it rigorous. So that's clearly new mathematics. It was clearly motivated by physics, by particle physics and condensed matter physics. So that part is very much like calculus, new mathematics motivated by physics. Many applications, both in mathematics and in physics, very much like in calculus. And as I said, in the case of calculus, this is a sign that it is a deep idea. Something that was invented for one thing and has applications everywhere, that's clearly a deep idea. And in that sense, I think quantum field theory is very much like calculus. The next thing in calculus in my list was the maturity test. And I recall the criterion. The criterion for maturity was that all courses are taught more or less the same. All books are more or less the same. Maybe the examples are different, but it's basically the same presentation. Not true for quantum field theory. If you take two quantum field theory books, they look totally different. One of them starts with scalars and then add interactions. The other one starts with fermions and scalars and gauge fields that are free and then adds the interactions. Another one starts from the renormalization group. Every one of them starts from a different starting point, and the subject has not yet been streamlined, so it's not yet mature. And there are indications that we still miss big things, and perhaps the theory should be reformulated, and I'm going to say more about that uh, soon. So how do we think of quantum field theory? There are two main approaches, and there are other kind of sub-approaches which are smaller. The first is the traditional approach, where we start with the Lagrangian, we write down the Lagrangian and we quantize it. I'll have a few more slides about that soon. And the second approach, which is more abstract, we write down the list of operators and they have correlation functions. And these correlation functions have to satisfy some conditions. I'll have some words to say about that soon. So in this approach, the traditional approach, this one is an outcome. We start from a Lagrangian and we derive the operators. More abstractly, we can think of the operator and say this is the definition of the theory. So let me spend one or two slides about this. So in the more abstract definition, in the more abstract presentation of quantum field theory, we start from a collection of operators, and they have some correlation functions, and they have satisfied some consistency conditions, like unitarity, these operators, are, the correlation functions are single-valued as we take one operator around another. We can formulate the theory in curved space and get unambiguous results, and so forth. And these are many, many consistency conditions. The system is highly over-constrained, and if you try to solve these consistency conditions, it's miraculous that you can find any solution to them at all. And if you find the solution, you get the exact solution. And that's very impressive when it works. Unfortunately, this approach is not very satisfactory because there isn't a clear starting point. Because you list, you kind of throw in the box all the consistency conditions and you put it, say, on the computer or something and you try to solve for something that satisfies all the consistency conditions and a solution comes out and say, ah, that's a good quantum field theory. But there's no clear starting point. The alternative is to use Lagrangian. This is the most traditional approaches. That's the most, that here the advantage is that we have a good starting point. We know what we're doing. We write some classical Lagrangian and then we quantize it. And we can use canonical quantization or functional integrals. There are other more sophisticated methods. Here we need to regularize to make the theory make sense. For example, instead of having a continuum, we can put a lattice there. And in condensed matter applications, the lattice is actually real, so it's not something that we just add to the system. Here the challenge is to prove two limits. One is the continuum limit, when we take the lattice spacing to zero. And the second, the large volume limit, when we take the size of the lattice to infinity. This is a huge challenge, and all the difficulties are buried in here. But this is one approach based on Lagrangians. 